right now, I want to do part one of the article written by CNN. It has been trending all week. The article, An Imposter Christianity is Threatening American Democracy. And uh, I read it Sunday, and my eyes uh, started to bleed, uh, bleed. So I went to our Mercury Museum and uh, started doing some research, asked uh, Tim Barton, David Barton, and the research staff to be able to do Can we compile some evidence that everything CNN is contending here is wrong? And, uh, gee, after nine pages of footnotes, yeah, we can do that. We can do that. So I'm going to start today and probably end it tomorrow in this hour, uh, and I'll make it tomorrow available uh, in our uh, newsletter. So subscribe at glenbeck.com for our free newsletter. So here we go. An imposter Christianity is threatening American democracy. The insurrection marked the first time. What is the insurrection? January 6th. The insurrection marked the first time many Americans realized the U.S. is facing, facing a burgeoning white Christian nationalist movement. This movement uses Christian language to cloak sexism and hostility to black people and non-white immigrants in its quest to create a white Christian America. Oh my gosh, now we really know what happened on January 6th. It was white Christians that were trying to get anybody with different color to get them out of here because that's what Jesus says, according to CNN. The media is so busy looking for anyone and anything to blame for January 6th and also at the same time serve two masters. Uh, Also take down not just the country, not just conservatives, but also Christianity. And if you have faith, now you are on trial. If you believe in God, free game. And the way they do it is by taking your faith and assigning a false label to it. Your faith, as you will see in this article, is now white Christian nationalist. Do you know of a church that promotes sexism and hostility to black people and non-white immigrants? If you do, please call because you're probably proud. I don't know of a church that is preaching that even in the language of dog whistles. Now, you might be thinking that CNN is referring to some random offshoot of Christianity, a minority whose relevancy must be called out because the article goes on to elaborate. White white Christian nationalist belief have infiltrated the religious mainstream thoroughly, so thoroughly that virtually any conservative Christian pastor who tries to challenge its ideology risks their career says Christian Cobes Dumez. Now, who's Christian Cobes Dumez? She's got a fancy name. She must be smart. Well, she's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. She says, these ideas are so widespread that any individual pastor or Christian leader who tries to turn the tide and say, let's look again at Jesus in scripture are going to be tossed aside. (gasps) My gosh, I'm terrified now. Okay, so first, CNN is clearly not talking about some random minority offshoot here. They're insinuating that every church in America, especially if you have a white pastor, is infected. Quote, virtually any conservative Christian pastor and any individual pastor or Christian leader. Well, I think that pretty much encapsulates almost all Christian churches. But funny enough, you're probably still grouped under this label, even if you're not white. If you believe in Christian doctrine to these people, you're the enemy. You know what they're really talking about here, right? Homosexuality and abortion. The doctrine on these issues is clear, and no true Christian pastor pastor will will, uh, tell you that either is not a sin. They will love the sinner. They will say that is your choice, but it is something that you need to deal with God with because this is what God says. 
but I'm not going to hate you. Oh my gosh, they want to overthrow the government with stuff like that. Doctrine cannot be changed due to the politics of the time. I'm sorry, but then again, not sorry at all. CNN brings out the big guns. They bring out the experts here to help them. And the one I just quoted is Christian Dumez. Well, she is a professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University. Now, Calvin University, that's a Christian university. Calvin. I don't know about Hobbes University, but Calvin is definitely a Christian, which gives her a basis as a Christian authority to criticize other Christians and to point out they're all off base. She's referenced six times in the article. It's an amazing high number, but she is a Dumez, huh? and she has a view of Christianity, and whether she's a good authority on Christian beliefs, I don't know. But we should consider her viewpoint on the subject, such as her work on the faith uh, of Hillary Clinton. Now, here's her description of her admiration for Hillary, Hillary Clinton's faith, which she says... She says she is a big fan of, and that should tell us whether she's a qualified expert on Christian beliefs or not. Because listen to what she says, and I quote, Having spent a lot of time reading the sermons and the diaries of intrepid Methodist women in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, I couldn't help but see Hillary Clinton as a torchbearer of this vibrant tradition of progressive faith and activism. Yet it puzzled me that so many people on the left and the right saw her as secular, or even a pagan. The more I begin to dig into her story, the more I begin to realize to tell her story is to tell the story of Christianity itself in recent American history. Ah, and the heavens open, and the sun beams down on the truth. Uh, by the way, CNN also fails to acknowledge that Domez uh, is currently openly contending against the university's Christian beliefs in important areas such as sexuality. She is currently the leader in opposition to the Christian beliefs in her church in that area, not only debating the university's position, but also being photographed in front of a pride flag. Now, just this one source alone, it's pretty clear CNN, uh, we know what they have a problem with here. The Christian faith, what bothers them, gets them so hot, and oh my gosh, they're after us, is the doctrine uh, of the Bible, which is on trial here. And anyone willing to pervert it is an expert, a theologian, or a historian. The article goes on to identify the key beliefs, three key beliefs associated with the white Christian nationalists. Oh, well, I'm going to take a break because you need to have a sip of water because you're going to realize pretty darn quickly that you have been calling for the overthrow of this government all because of black and Hispanic people or people of another color, which I shan't express at this time. Raise your hands and praise the Lord for CNN. Gang, stop the music. They have caught us. They have caught us. CNN says that we are all worshiping an imposter Christianity. And they have somebody named Christian on poor. That kind of has Christ in the name, so I think we should pay attention. The article, released on Sunday, identifies three key beliefs associated with the white Christian nationalists. And here they are, and ask yourself right now, do I belong to a hate group? Belief number one. <laughs> a belief that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. <laughs> Gotcha! You're in a hate group. For this section, CNN rolls out their expert of experts on this topic. Yale professor Philip Gorski 
Is he a historian? Is he a theologian? No, he's neither. He's a sociology professor, which is code for I'm a radical leftist practicing uh, in a uh, in a uh, uh, a role here that was designed by Karl Marx. Yeah, yeah, sociology. Uh, Karl Marx, look it up. Anyway, he's just looking to indoctrinate as many young minds as he can. And so CNN says, let's find the best and the brightest for this little thesis. CNN re- refers to him 12 times in this article. He says, erasing the line separating piety from politics is a key characteristic of white Christian nationalism. Wow. Aren't I told every day that I am just somebody that is just a horrible, horrible person unless I apply the politics uh, of this new woke religion? Anyway, uh, erasing the line separating piety from politics is a key characteristic of white Christian nationalism. Many want to reduce or or erase the separation of church and state, say those who study the movement. Who who are they? Who, Who are those who are studying the movement? Why aren't you quoting them? What is separation of church and state? Well, according to our court and public policy de- de- decisions, it includes an individually, individual personally expressing his faith and beliefs in public. So they believe Christians are theocrats for wanting to see individuals receive the Constitution's guaranteed protection for free speech and religious expression that many courts have ignored recently. Now consider some of the separation of church and state restrictions that CNN and this Yale professor just think as nonsense. For instance, uh, a student was prohibited from writing a research paper on a religious topic uh, or drawing religious artwork in class or carry a personal Bible onto the school grounds. Uh, School forbade a Bible from being placed in its reference library. Wow, try to understand Shakespeare without the Bible. Cadets at a state military academy were banned from praying over their meals individually. A state employee in Minnesota was barred from parking his car in the state parking lot because of a religious sticker on his bumper. Five-year-old kindergarten student in Saratoga Springs, New York, was forbidden to say a prayer over her lunch and was scolded by the teacher for doing so. Senior citizens who regularly gathered at a community center in Balk Springs, Texas, prohibited from paying, praying over their meals. A library em- employee in Russellville, Kentucky, was barred from wearing her necklace because it had a small cross on it. College students serving residential assistance in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, prohibited from holding Bible studies in their own personal dorm rooms. A a school lunch official in St. Louis, Missouri, caught an an elementary student praying over his lunch, lifted the student from his seat, reprimanded him from other students, took him to the principal, who ordered him, stop praying! Now, there are hundreds of these examples, and that's what they claim is the separation of church and state. So what does the separation of church and state actually mean in a historic sense? Well, the only founder that talked about the separation of church and state um, was Thomas Jefferson. So we should ask him, because the progressives credit him with the uh, the, um, the, uh, origin of that phrase, and they love it so much. So it was Jefferson's firm position that the federal government had no authority to interfere, limit, regulate, or prohibit public religious expressions. You mean like praying over lunch? (laughs) Yes, exactly. And he stated that on multiple occasions. Oh, I wish I had 10 or 12 examples. Oh, I do. I do. Oh, it's going to take us more than two days to get through all of this but by gum we'll do it more in just a second all right so we're debunking the cnn article that america 
has a real problem because Christianity, all the churches have been taken hostage, and now they're white nationalist Christian churches. So they have gone on to identify the three key beliefs associated with white Christian nationalists. The first one is a belief the United States was founded as a Christian nation. Okay, so we uh, we told you about this, and then the separation of church and state, we showed you what was being passed. Uh, But I want to get real quickly here to what separation of church and state actually means, okay? We have to go to Thomas Jefferson because he's the only one that said this. It was Jefferson's firm position that the federal government had no authority to interfere with, limit, regulate, or prohibit public religious expressions, a position he stated on many occasions like this, quote, no power over the freedom of religion is delegated to the United States by the Constitution, First Amendment. In the matter of religion, I have considered, considered that its free exercise is placed by the Constitution independent of the powers of the federal government. Quote, our excellent Constitution has not placed our religious rights under the power of any public functionary. Now, none of these statements or other statements by Jefferson contain even the slightest hint that religion should be isolated or removed from public square or that the public square should be secularized. Rather, that the government could not limit or regulate any religious expressions. So now... Let's understand the concern here. Jefferson wrote about the uh, separation of church and state to people of faith who were saying, I don't trust this government. I don't trust. We, oh, they will find a way to stop us. Jefferson replied to them January 1st, 1802, assuring them that they had nothing to fear. Quote, the government would not meddle with your religious expression, whether it occurs in public or private. Quoting, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared in the First Amendment that their legislature should, quote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. So he was using that as a metaphor, saying, don't worry about it. They're not going to touch religion because they're not able to touch religion. It is beyond their reach. The exact opposite of what the Yale professor, who is neither a theologian or a historian, is saying in this lovely CNN article. Let me move on. There's more, but you'll get it in our newsletter. (sighs) Well, I gotta take a breath. I mean, I really hate completely blowing up CNN's first key belief of white Christian nationalists right at the beginning. But, you know, maybe they're just ignorant or they're being completely dishonest. You'll have to figure out the article and ignorance goes on. One of the most popular beliefs, writes CNN, among white Christian nationalists is that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation. The founding fathers were all orthodox, evangelical Christians, and that God has chosen the U.S. for a special role in history. But the notion that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation is bad history and bad theology, says Philip Gorsky, the sociologist who is neither, again, a theologian or a historian. But he is the co-author of The Flag and the Cross, White Christian Nationalism and the Threat to American Democracy. So it makes him authority on his opinion. He says it's a half-truth, a mythological version of American history. So saith the Yale sociology professor. Amen. Well, since I didn't get any real historians to comment for this article, let me give you some very well-documented footnotes and quotes that are actually historically accurate. On literally hundreds of occasions in the past two centuries, state and federal courts have routinely declared America as a Christian nation. For starters, in a unanimous decision in 1844, the U.S. Supreme Court confirmed America as, quote, a Christian country. 1892, Supreme Court did it again, delivered a unanimous ruling declaring America is, quote, a Christian nation. In 1931, Supreme Court reaffirmed the same position for a third time, stating we are, quote, a Christian people. Now, I know you have no respect for the Supreme Court unless it agrees with you, but that's what the Supreme Court has said. 
But maybe we can go for some presidents, because presidents have all made comments on this, including John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, John Taylor, Zachary Taylor, James Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, William McKinley, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Richard Nixon. Hey, here's one from Lyndon Baines Johnson that you'll like if you're a progressive. Uh, In these last 200 years, we have guided the building of our nation and our society by those principles and precepts brought to earth nearly 2,000 years ago on that first Christmas. Oh, and then, if I may quote, America was born as a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Who said that? Oh, it gives me great joy to say Woodrow frickin' Wilson! You're God on the left! But let's go back even further in our history. 1606, Virginia Charter declared the colony was started for the propagation of Christian religion to such people as yet live in ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God and Jesus Christ. Mayor, uh, the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact of 1620 declared their endeavor was undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. 1629, Charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony declared that winning the country to the knowledge and obedience of the only one true God and Savior of mankind in the Christian faith is the principal end of this plantation or colony. 1639. Do I need to go on? I mean, I, I can do this all day long. Get it in the uh, newsletter. Okay. Let me, let me just give you one more. Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren. I believe no one can read history of our country without realizing the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. Whether we look at the first charter of Virginia or the charter of New England or the charter of Massachusetts Bay, the fundamental order of Connecticut, same objective is present. A Christian land governed by Christian principles. Congress has also said, 1852, 1853, when a group sought to complete secularization of the public square, House Judiciary Committee... Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. At the time of the adoption of the Constitution and the amendments and the universal sentiment that it was Christianity that should be uh, encouraged, not any one sect or denomination. In this age, there can be no substitute for Christianity. The Judiciary Committee, we are Christians, not because the law demands it, not to gain exclusive benefits or to avoid legal disabilities, but from choice and education. And this in a land is thus universally Christian, which uh, is what to be is what is expected, what is desired, and what we shall pay due regard to Christianity. Uh, House of Representatives said the same thing. Now, they immediately on CNN counter with, yeah, (laughs) but you really don't need to go any further. I mean, none of virtually, I'm quoting, virtually none of the founding fathers could be classified as evangelical Christians. Really? John Adams, signer of the Declaration of Independence. The Holy Ghost carries with it the whole Christian system in this earth. Not a baptism, not a marriage, not a sacrament can be administered, but by through the Holy Ghost and the authority religious, blah, blah, blah. Samuel Adams, I reply, I rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ for a pardon of all my sins. I conceive I can, we cannot better express ourselves than by humbly supplicating the supreme ruler of the world and promoting the speedy bringing up of the holy and happy period when the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ make, do I need to go on? John Joshua Bartlett, signer of the Declaration of Independence. I confess before God our grave transgressions and implore his pardon and forgiveness through the merits and meditation of Jesus Christ. Gunning Bedford, signer of the uh, the Constitution. Uh, to the tribune of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be ascribed all honor and dominion forevermore. Amen. Carl, uh, Charles Carroll, signer of the Declaration. On the mercy of my Redeemer, uh, I rely for salvation uh, and on his merits, not the works I have done. I hope that through and by merit, sufferings, and meditation of my only Savior and Jesus Christ, I may be admitted to the kingdom, blah, blah, blah. How about Alexander Hamilton? If I wrap it, maybe you'll hear it. I have a tender reliance on the mercy of the Almighty through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hamilton also recommended the formation of what he titled the Christian Constitutional Society and listed two goals for its foundation. First... 
the support of the Christian religion, and second, support of the Constitution. John Hancock. Hancock called on the state of Massachusetts to pray that all nations may bow down to the scepter of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John Hart, signer of the Declaration. I give and recommend my soul to the hands of the Almighty God who gave me my body uh, to be here in the earth, to be buried in a decent and Christian-like manner. Patrick Henry, Henry, being a Christian, is a character which I prize far above all this world has or can boast. Samuel Huntington, signer of the Declaration. It becomes a people publicly to supplicate the pardon that we must obtain forgiveness through the merits and meditation of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. James Madison, you know, the guy who wrote the Constitution and the signer of the, uh, of the Constitution, a watchful eye must be kept uh, on ourselves, lest while we are building ideal monuments of renown and bliss here, we might neglect to have our names enrolled in the annals of heaven. Robert Payne, signer of the declaration. Do I need to go on? Because I have uh, like 12 more. You know what? Get them in the nine pages of footnotes that you can look up yourself. But the article goes on at CNN. For evidence that the United States was founded as a secular nation, look no further than the 1797 Treaty of Tripoli. As an agreement, the U.S. negotiated with a country in present-day Libya to end the practice of pirates attacking American ships. And it was ratified unanimously by a Senate, still half-filled with the signers of the Constitution, that declared the government of the United States of America is not, in any sense, founded on a Christian religion. Now, I want you to notice that little gotcha quote. Because it is a little quote. In fact, it has a period where there is no period. Now, is this seriously the only thing CNN has that they can say? Separation of church and state, which is absolutely the opposite of what they say it is. And then this one. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you've seen how people talk back those days. The Gettysburg Address was very short compared to how they spoke in George Washington times. They went on and on and on. It's like, okay, I got it. You don't have a television. So what's with the short sentence? Do you think maybe CNN could have pulled this out of context? No. We'll find out next.